It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is the Locked On Auburn Podcast, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast presented by Fetch Me Home Delivery. Yes, the holidays are coming up. Fetch Me will still deliver you food. Even on Thanksgiving? I don't know. I'm going to be honest. I don't know. Okay. You probably have food on Thanksgiving, but maybe it's Wednesday night. Don't shake your head no. You're coming over to my place. I, di- I didn't shake my head no. You shook, you shook your head no. I well, maybe that. you're in my situation, but you don't have a great friend who invited you over. That's fair. That's and you're fair. like, you know what? I want to think I I need a turkey. But here's the thing with Fetch Me Home Delivery, mm-hmm. you always have a great friend. Oh, just go to fetchmehomedelivery.com. Mm. Oh yeah, the free Fetch Me Delivery app, and use promo code Fetch Me Two Zero Fetch Me Twenty No Spaces Fetch Me Twenty for your first delivery free. Absolutely free. Maybe you got family like I do coming down. They'll be uh, they'll be here Tuesday night slash Wednesday night. And you're like, I don't want to leave the house. I don't leave the house. You know what we're doing? Fetch me. Sounds like your family's a lot different than mine. Because when my family's around, all I want to do is leave the house. (laughs) Wow. How about that? How about that? I'm Zach Blackerby, joined by Michael Pappas of ESPN 1067. We're in the studio I don't like, so if the sound is off a little bit, apologies there. But happy Thanksgiving week. Happy Iron Bowl week to you. Auburn defeats Samford. They covered the spread. Didn't expect them to do that. I did. All right. Auburn is what? What? What's the record? Are they eight and three right now? Then they're ten and two against the spread this season. How about that? I think Malzahn loves killing bad teams. He loves it so much so that he leaves the starters in in the second half, and you lose a guy going into the first half of the Iron Bowl. Yeah, I don't think that one's on Malzon though. I mean, and hey, why is he playing? Sherwood? Why is Sherwood in the game when they're up by 30 points? That's crazy. That is a, uh, that, that's a big gaff, especially when you look at I, I assume what Auburn is going to do defensively against Alabama next week will be similar to the game plan to what they did against LSU. They're going to have a lot of defensive mm-hmm. backs on the field. Sherwood would have started next week. Yeah, that may be true, but I get so. What is Sherwood? Your fifth corner? No. Fourth corner? No. I mean, I I think this team sees him as a starter. I mean, as far as athleticism goes, outside of Noah, I mean, he's your best guy. But he, that doesn't make him a starter. I mean, I, your I think, starters. I think, it, are... I think it does. I think it does. Because I don't think Auburn's defense is like okay, we're starting four defensive backs. I think they see six guys that they can play in the defensive backfield. Yeah, but if you're just looking at corners, because Sherwood doesn't play very much safety. To say that losing one of your best defensive backs against the, arguably the best or second or third best passing offense in the country isn't a big deal, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. I think where we differ here is I don't think Sherwood is one of the best defensive backs. I think if you can say he's the like the fourth cornerback. Who's better than him? So you got Noah and Javaris. Then yeah. what? I don't think he's much better. I mean, Christian Tut, I guess, plays play a different, different position. So that's irrelevant. So who's your next corner? Um, oh, my gosh. I always forget his name every time. He had, a, like, two or three really good games earlier this season. McCurry? Yeah. Okay. I, I, so even there, if he's your number three or number four guy, like, I, I think he's in the – yes, he's the guy who would be playing a lot of minutes against Alabama, but – He's like he's not, I guess, technically a starter because he's not listed as the top guy on the depth chart. So even if he had pulled every single starter, there's still a decent chance Sherwood is in that game because a he's a younger guy and b he is technically not a starter. And I also think it'd be a little bit different if he got injured. Like this was a mistake he made. Gus can't, I mean, that's not something that's really in Gus's control. You don't think how people tackle is not a coaching thing? We're way off on this. 
You th- you think? I mean that that's fun. how people tackle can be a coach. And you think Gus has taught any of these guys how to tackle? Yeah, I mean indirectly, but absolutely, they've gone over that. One hundred percent. But then the guy, if you're mad at the and way he tackles, like the guy, you sh- the, the lack of awareness of it all, as far as going into the Iron Bowl. I mean, it's always a storyline every year for every team. It's like, oh, it's, it seems like left and right. And this is the conspiracy theory coming out. But to say it's not a thing is ridiculous. But people, people get hit with targeting the week before they play Alabama all the time. You have to know that, and you're up by thirty. Yeah, the, the lack of awareness was tremendous to me. I think this one's on Sherwood. I don't think this one is on. It's still a Gus. big deal, though. I mean, it ma- it definitely matters, but I don't. This is fascinating to me. Okay, it, it definitely you were so matters. off on this. You were way off. Uh, that okay? That's fine. All right. What else stood out I, to you about the game then? If that's not your storyline coming out of the game, what is? Um, that Auburn really got through it mostly unscathed. I mean, no major injuries. They had a backup cornerback who's going to miss the first half of the Alabama game, and that's basically it. I'm curious to see uh, if we hear anything about Schwartz. You and I watched the first yeah. half together, and you know, I was kind of making some sarcastic comments. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, they're going to Schwartz early and often against Sanford, and then it's like he got targeted like five or six times, and then he kind of limped off the field. I don't think it's anything big. I, I think he would have gone back in if it was an important game, but – that's um that's something to monitor. I think it's interesting that they finally went to him in this case opposed to um saving it, but that's um I think that's the second biggest story is the Schwartz usage early and then, you know, how imp- uh, it looked like an ankle type thing. He had a mm-hmm. little slight limp going off the field and uh, I, he he didn't go back on the field after that. So, I think that is um that is worth monitoring. I feel like we would know if he was injured. You know? Yeah, I do too. I do too. It's still like, you know, is he 100%? Is he mm-hmm. 90? Is he 80? So I, I don't know. I don't know. That I think that's that's kind of it. That's kind of it. The starters stayed in way longer than I thought, which is interesting. They did uh, They did enough with Harold Joyner, like I wanted to. You know, I talked about that on the show last week. And outside of that, they really didn't do anything that I said that they should do. <laughs> so... But uh, I mean, I think I think it's predictable in regards to you know Auburn wanted to run the football against like a bad Sanford team. They still had to run it outside. They weren't super great at running it in between the tackles. So I'm curious to see how they do that going forward against Alabama. I don't know what happened, but over the weekend I got significantly less confident that Auburn can win against Alabama. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know what happened there, but I I just don't. I don't think it matters who's a quarterback on Saturday. Uh I I think that I mean it as far as Samford goes for this um I I thought this game was pretty much what you want from Auburn you saw uh, I feel like Cord Sandberg playing the way that he did I know it was against Samford but it does give you a little bit of maybe not a complete sigh of relief if god forbid something happens to Bo but at least a little bit extra confidence than you had before yeah um if we're looking ahead, I don't really think that Alabama is is that special of a team right now. Okay. Uh, we watched the beginning of the Alabama and Western Carolina game together also, and you know Western Carolina moved the football in the first quarter. They had the ball for like 10 minutes of, in the first quarter, uh, and then they turned it over twice. Mm-hmm. And Alabama's offense... I'm going to say this all week. It's going to sound weird every time I say it, but they, Alabama's offense doesn't put drives together. They score a bunch of points, sure, but they don't put drives together. And and one of the strengths of this Auburn team this season is that they've given up what two big plays. Now they've been really at bad times, one to Florida and one to Georgia. Oh, they they gave a big win against Oregon too. I was thinking Oregon and Florida, but yeah, I, f- I forgot about the Georgia game. Yeah. Okay, Th- three big plays. Yeah, still, season, so your your point's still there, right? You know, it's a really big strength of this Auburn defense is that they don't they don't give up those massive chunk plays, and they're very good at tackling in the open field. Which, again, if you watch this Alabama offense, that's their whole thing is they throw short passes to their elite wide receivers mm-hmm. who are incredible after the catch. Catch it short, run it long. Yeah, yeah. And they for the first at least half of the season they struggled to run block. They were averaging 
barely 80 yards a game on the ground. Uh, Najee Harris has certainly come on since then. Uh, he's been incredible lately, but we've seen, I mean, every time this Auburn team has come up against a running back who's having a, a very good season, they've played a lot of the SEC's top running backs, and they've really bottled all of them up. Mm -hmm. So I think Auburn's got a pretty good shot. Uh, if Bo Nix doesn't throw the ball to Xavier McKinney like four times, uh, I think Auburn's got a pretty good chance to win. Your team. Greetings 12 Locked On Seahawks podcast. Who that family and welcome into this week's Locked On Saints. Hello to all you Foxborough faithful Locked On Patriots. Every day. Another victory Monday. It's officially Throwback Tuesday. Crossover Wednesday episode. Thursday Night Football. It is Red Friday edition. When it comes to the biggest stories. And so the Chiefs news story of today is unfortunately at this point in the season it is continuing to be injuries. You need to be locked on. We've touched about it on this show and all over Twitter and all that. And all of a sudden, we have a great football team with a championship defense, a franchise quarterback, a running game that can't be stopped. This is exactly why we watch football. Good quarterbacks are maximized in good systems, and that's exactly what we're seeing with Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers this season. Wherever you get your podcasts. In the Apple Podcast app. Google Podcasts. Spotify. Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Your team. Okay, let's get it. Locked on LSU, your team every day. Welcome back in to Locked on Bama. You're going to hear about it all week long on Locked on Buckeyes. Every day. Monday through Friday. When it comes to the biggest stories. Everybody's talking, and we're not excluded from the mix. Everything that you could want from a postgame recap, we're going to do. They're far and away the number one team in the country. Winning at this point is the only thing that matters. It's going to put you in meaningful games later. You need to be locked on. Tua is the best of us. He is an incredible kid, immensely talented, and it's such a shame that his fairy tale ending was actually at the beginning. Wherever you get your podcasts. In the Apple Podcast app. Google Podcasts. Spotify. Hit us up with those five stars, and we're going to be here five days a week. Oh, One yeah. star for every day of the week. Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. If you want to hear more shows like this, well, just go to LockedOnPodcast.com. All right, let's uh, let's go to some voicemails, and we'd love to hear from you. Also, do you think losing a defensive back is important going into the Iron Bowl? We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. 205-502-4285. And uh, let's start with the classic. Hey, guys. <laughs> Tried and true, baby. All right, here we go. Hey, Zach. This is Ben from North Georgia. I uh, love the podcast. Uh, it's a great way to help me drive every single day. Uh, question for you. How come how come college football coaches are the only contractual people who work that employers have to pay them to get rid of them? So the reason I'm asking that is if you look at it from the standpoint of every person that's ever worked on a contract, there are expectations and listed benchmarks that you must achieve or your employment is terminated. College football coaching seems to be the only profession on the face of the earth where if you don't achieve your benchmarks in coaching, you, the employer can't let go of you without paying a substantial penalty like that's how on right now with $27 million. I mean, as an Auburn fan, should the expectation be you're going to win at least go 9-3 and three at the minimum in a season? And people could say that's difficult considering our competition, but if you think about it, if you just win one game between Georgia, Alabama, LSU, that right there gives you the ability to drop a major game against a rival or pick up a major game against a rival with two wins or two losses, depending upon how the season holds out. It keeps you in contention, though. One other question, and this is just something for an idea to pull over. Um, why is it Rodney Gardner being asked to look at offensive line recruits? The man knows how to recruit a defensive lineman that can absolutely take apart an offensive line. I mean, look at his history. Richard Seymour, David Pollock, uh, Montrevious Adams, Carl Lawson, uh, our current crop of defensive linemen. Shouldn't they be asking a guy that knows how to deconstruct an offensive line for a little bit of help on the current recruit? Because if he knows what it takes to beat him, shouldn't he be asked, hey, 
you find a defensive lineman that can beat this guy that we're, we're recruiting right now for offensive line. Either way, love the show, and you all have a great day. Thank you so much for the call, man. Uh, appreciate it. Let's start with the first question first. I mean, I think it has all to do with, with leverage and people's desperation to, to win football games. And, you know, maybe they find a guy that can be the next Nick Saban or Davo Sweeney or, you know, whatever. So it is kind of fascinating to me that I agree. I can't think of another industry where it has, you know, a buyout similar to what what coaches have. It's a good gig if you can get it. There's no doubt about it. But I think it really just comes down to leverage. Um, no, that does happen in other industries. Like what? Um, like if you ever hear of someone getting a severance package, it's basically a buyout. Like in the issue is that college football coaches get fired without cause, like technically, because there's, it's like not winning enough football games is not technically like not fulfilling your job requirement or I guess is the way I understand it. So their buyout is technically like a severance package that they get. And so like, I know of people who, you know, companies will be reorganizing or merging or they get acquired or something and people are losing their jobs. And because of that, they're getting severance packages because they're not getting fired for anything that they did. They're not getting fired for cause. So you, it's basically any situation where you sign some sort of a contract and you're getting terminated without breaching the terms of that contract. All right. Then the second question regards to Rodney Garner recruiting offensive line. So my understanding on how the recruiting strategy is at at most schools and Auburn falls under this is obviously if there's a specific position player, your position coach is going to be involved with recruitment. If they're a bigger recruiter, a guy that, you know, the team really, really wants their coordinator, or, you know, Malzahn may be involved with it a little bit more. Um, but the gist of it is, is by position player. And then your question, you know, why don't Rodney Garner get involved in it? Um, they, they also have geographic areas. I believe Rodney Garner has Georgia, which makes sense him being from there. But so much of uh, recruiting is kind of the position coaches becoming like a father figure to these guys are to kind of come in and, you know, move away, you know, for the next three or four years from their family for the first time. And so. Or a big brother figure. Sure. Kenny Dana Lincoln telling him. Yeah. It just kind of kind of depends on the the situation. Exactly. But that's, um, I don't think you want to pull Rodney Garner away from, from recruiting defensive linemen. I think some of it's a workload thing. I think some of it is, uh, Hey, you need to hire an offensive line coach because you know it's uh, that's not Ronnie Garner's job. Could he do it? Yeah, I think he could, but I I just I don't think you want to mess with the guy that's probably had the most success recruiting a position group over the last you know since he's been yeah. here. So that's that's kind of my answer to that. I'm sure he could do that, but then what does that say to the recruit about the offensive line coach? And it's like, well, why is the defensive line guy recruiting me? You know, what does that mean? So uh, I think there's a couple of couple of things there. Uh, I'm sure that all of the position coaches like watch film on different players. Like it, how do I want to put this? I'm sure it's not out of, out of the realm of possibility for the defensive backs coach or the wide receivers coach to call upon each other if they have a if they're on the fence about a recruit and ask the other guy to watch some film. I wouldn't think it's out of the realm of possibility for the offensive line coach to ask Rodney Gardner, hey, I'm thinking about going after this kid. What do you think about him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they don't just, you know, say, okay, this guy's ranked in the top 100 in rivals and, you know, he's it's only three and a half hours away. Let's go get him. You know, that's Mm -hmm. that's not that's not how it's working. So and they are a team at the end of the day. So I'm sure they do a lot together. Yeah, there's been a lot of voicemails about. You know, last week Painter kind of put out a a request to to call in and you know send a checklist of the next Auburn coach, and I have a few of them pulled up here. I don't really want to go that route today. I mean, just because it's Iron Bowl week, and I think it's interesting. I mean, obviously everyone wants a better record against your rivals, and Malzahn has a chance to to do that this weekend. And most of the points Gus is doing. It's just the rivals thing, which, I mean, the, the issue is obvious. You need to win those games. So we'll see what happens. He's got a great opportunity to be in Alabama this Saturday. And I, I don't know, man, I, I just go so back and forth on, on how I'm going to pick this game later in the week. But 
I, I, it's really going to come down to, to me. I don't think it's about Auburn's defense versus Alabama's offense. That's kind of the big storyline. Just strength on strength, but strength on strength. Wow. But I think uh, I think it's really going to come down to you know, what does Bo Nix do? He's not good against good teams. We've seen that this year. But like Alabama's defense isn't great. I think you could argue that it's not good. But neither is LSU's defense, and he had a really hard time moving the football against them as well. So I, I just I don't feel good about Auburn's offense in this one. We'll see. I I think Auburn's offense has looked much better since I guess the LSU game. Really? Yeah. Um, obviously not perfect against Georgia, but I mean, that was Bo's best game against a good team by far. I go back and forth on, like, should you count those two drives or not? Because the defense just backed up. The defense just let them have it. So I, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about that. And it's like he, he still completed. He took what the defense gave him, so you don't want to fault the guy for it. But how legitimate were those two drives? Like, I, I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. But, I mean, even... Even before that, for the whole game, I thought he was much more accurate than he was against Florida and LSU. Um, the receivers struggled in that game, but yeah, maybe you're right. But it is something that it's it's definitely a game where it's strength on strength mm-hmm. and I don't know weakness on weakness, if you want to put it that way. Uh, one place where Auburn might have the edge, though, the Alabama punter stinks. Mm. Stinks. Maybe somebody makes a play there. Mm. Special teams is important. We've seen that in the past in this game. Yep. So that'd be uh, that'd be interesting to see. Michael, where can people find you and hear you? Uh, follow me on Twitter at Couch Potato. Follow me on Twitter at Z Blackerby. Follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Auburn. This has been another edition of the Locked On Auburn podcast. It's the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. <laughs>